I had passed out on my couch. My youngest son, Jackson, came over and woke me up, and almost an impromptu intervention. You can't go on like this. You know, I want you to be around. G'day, and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. In today's episode, we continue our look into PTSD's effect on first responders. My guest today is David Hargreaves. Dave started his paramedic career in 1985, and over the course of this time has developed PTSD as a result. In today's episode, Dave describes some of the work involved in the paramedic field and how it can over time cause PTSD. He also talks about his journey in learning to manage his PTSD and where he is at in his journey today. Hello Dave, and welcome to Wellbeing. Thank you Jack, Um, I appreciate you uh, inviting me to talk on your show today. Before we begin, could you tell us a little bit about yourself David? I'm 61 years old, born in, uh, in Barrie, Ontario. come from a family of first responders. I started my paramedic career in 1985, so it's been 37 years so far. And is that how you got into the paramedic field, by your, by your parents, was it? Actually, no, it wasn't my parents. Uh, my dad worked for the telephone company. My mom stayed at home. But the, my older brother is a firefighter. I have another brother who's a paramedic. My sister isn't a first responder, but she married a police officer from our town. So it made for some interesting Christmas dinners. I did uh, you know, the, the uh, on-road work, uh, frontline paramedic, for about 14 years. And then I went into management for, for about two to three years. Realized that I wasn't cut out for that. So I've been back on the road since uh, 2002. How common would you say is PTSD in those serving as paramedics? Probably about one in five, I would think, would exhibit some some form uh, or some degree of PTSD uh, during their career. Obviously significantly higher because of the nature of the job. And, um, and the suicide rate is pretty much the, the same. It's about five times the, uh, the national average. What were some of the experiences that you had while on the job that were quite confronting? There's different types of, of calls that all have an impact on you. I think some of the, the, the most impactful for me were the, the pediatric VSAs, and VSAs are you know, vital signs absent. So when you have the, you know, the, the death of, uh, of a child, those ones really impact you. Traumatic death um, from, from car accidents, suicides really impact you as well. And it, it's not just the patient that, you, that you're dealing with that impacts you. It, it's the emotional charge of the scene, you know, with, with family members being present or bystanders and that kind of stuff. But, um, that, that takes a, a big toll on you as well, I think. When you encounter these kind of confronting situations, how did you deal with them in mentally? Well, I really didn't know how to deal with them, Jack. In the beginning, the PTSD was only... You know, officially recognized in, I think it was 1980, early 80s, I think. And when I started in 87, it was very much um, like a, an old school mentality. It was suck it up and, and move on to the next call. If you showed any signs of, I know now it isn't a weakness, but it was looked at as a weakness, then they just figured that you're not, you're not cut out for the job. It was pretty much stuffed down emotionally. It wasn't talked about. And then it's, uh, I guess, about... Oh, maybe 10, 10, 12 years into the job, I had a, a string of really dynamic uh, calls that didn't turn out the way I wanted to, and I started coping maladaptively with uh, with alcohol. I, I'd come home from uh, a bad shift and uh, you know isolate, numb myself to uh, to not feel you know the impact that it was it was having on me, and uh, I don't know if it was a conscious or subconscious decision to avoid dealing with those things, but it was also at that time, there wasn't any resources available to to reach out for. When was the first time you kind of became aware that you may have had PTSD? Was it around that time you mentioned then? Uh, I guess maybe about, it was, it was a little after that. And I didn't realize that at the time, looking back, uh, you know, obviously with hindsight, I can see the, you know, the signs were there. I just didn't recognize them or maybe I just chose not to. I don't know. But I noticed that, you know, I, I was drinking more and I was isolating, uh, I was avoiding. And then I started to have really intrusive dreams, night sweats, night, night terrors. And it, it wasn't, you know, any particular call per se. It's more like a, a culmination of all the calls. It kept piling up, not realizing that my resiliency tank, you're constantly withdrawing from it um, because of the nature of the job and not having the tools or the knowledge of how to replenish that tank. You know, it, it, it becomes empty. So that, that continued 
continued for you know, quite a while, and then COVID hit a couple of years ago, and that was that was the perfect storm for mm-hmm. you know a paramedic that uh, coped with alcohol because you know I, I could come home, you know we weren't out socializing, uh, you're isolating, and you know it wasn't abnormal not to go out because nobody was allowed to go out. It, it was kind of the you know unfortunately the perfect storm, uh, and you know everything lined up to uh, you know lead me down that path. When would you say in the paramedic field, everyone kind of started taking things like PTSD seriously? I think it started to come into the conversation about uh, 10 years ago. And, you know, there was still a a stigma, uh, and there still is to a degree um, now. But I find that the change is going to be generational. Like the old school, uh, people still look at it. The old school medics as as, uh, a weakness, I think. Um, but I see the younger medics coming out um, out of school, and they're you know more willing to talk about their mental illness or their, their depression or their anxiety. So it, 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 it is changing slowly, but I think it's only been in the last uh, ten years or so that it's it's really come in, into the conversation. What more do you think we need to do to make sure that we are talking about it a bit more and the, and have more supports in place? I think the the problem that I noticed, Jack, is that we tend to be very reactive to situations and to incidents mm. in, instead of being proactive. Um, like with, the, with peer support and our critical incident stress management teams, they're all fine, but they're all post-incident. Um, we're not doing a good enough job of preparing the younger medics coming out of school you know, on how to, how to handle the stresses um, of the job and, and how to balance life and mm. work and how to... Um, you know how to manage the, the stress. So I think I think there has to be a bit of it. We have to continue with the uh, you know with the peer support and, and the CISM teams and stuff. But I think we could do a lot better job of preparing not just medics but any any first responder, prepare them for for what could happen on the job. So it sounds like in a lot of ways that prevention is greater than cure in a way. Uh, you, you know, I, I think if that was in place um, with me, I don't uh, you know I, I can't say if it would have. have uh, avoided the PTSD, but I, I think it might have uh, mitigated it or perhaps lessened the impact, or maybe I wouldn't have waited so so long to uh, to seek help. Because it sounds like also that in, the line, in this line of work, that it's almost inevitable that some people will develop it. So I guess that's a really good point that you mentioned, that it's more about we have to prepare people. It's, it's going to happen, but if they're prepared, then we're going to deal with it a lot better. Absolutely, because we're not taught that, and and I think that's the problem um, is that by not preparing people ahead of time, then not only do you risk um, you know increasing the the, the chances of of uh, a psychological injury, but you're also looking at the financial impact um, that it has on the on the different organizations or services. Because now, if someone goes off after an incident, I mean they're still getting their wage, or, you know, while they while they get treatment. Um, but then you also have to replace that person. So I think, you know, the, the return on investment for mm. having a, mm. a, a program uh, in place before um, or, you know, like for a new recruit would more than pay off. Um, I know that up here in Canada, when they start something like that, in the first year, for every dollar they invest, they, they have a return on investment of about a dollar thirty, And um, after three years, that moves up to you know, between 2 and $3 for a dollar they spend on a program. Just in time saved from skip time, or treatment and you know backfilling shifts and that kind of thing. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is David Hardgreaves, a Canadian paramedic with a PTSD journey. How did the PTSD affect or change the relationships you had with others? It had a huge impact. It, it, it cost me my marriage. Obviously, that uh, added a, a, lot, a lot of stress. Hmm. And in the last, um, I guess, about the last seven or eight years. Uh, it affected. It started leaking into other relationships and uh, affected my relationship with my sons, um, Jackson and Alex. I guess I there, there's just a, a sense of of numbness and mm. not being able to to to, to trust and. And when you, you're when you have PTSD and you combine that with coping with with alcohol, you, you just become so emotionally emotionally calloused, really, and you just can't invest yourself in, in relationships. And and it really affected you know my family and, and myself. Now, in hindsight, looking 
back. There is a slight silver lining with the PTSD and the treatment that I received is, is now that, you know, um, I'm in a much, much better place. Mm. Those relationships are better than they've ever been. But that's as much credit to, you know, my partner Lisa and, and, uh, and my sons that they did support me and they stood behind me and they encouraged me and they checked in on me. I don't know if I would have made the uh, post-traumatic growth that I have without them. Did you find that as the PTSD progressed that there were things that you could once do in daily life but were becoming a bit harder or were a bit affected? Yeah, there was a lot of things. I, um, again, I was, I was isolating a lot, so I wasn't getting out socialising. Um, making decisions became really hard. Um, I mean, I could stand in the grocery store and look at, you know, five different kinds of, of pasta sauce and not be able to make up my mind. I was mm. a, you know, almost afraid almost afraid to make a decision. And I think that carried over from from work. Did it ever affect work in any way or was it, it was was that kind of like separate from how it affected your your daily life? It, it, it did affect work. Um, I noticed in the last probably three or four years when I would get up in the morning and put on my uniform, I would break out into a sweat, um, mm. just, just putting my uniform on. And when I got to um, uh, my, my station and was checking the, uh, you know, the equipment in the ambulance and, the, and you know, the drugs and that kind of stuff, I would break out in a sweat again. I used to have to carry a, a face cloth in my uh, tactical pants in my side pocket so that I could I could wipe my face. I was sweating that much. And I'd be in the station and the tones would go off. And it almost felt like um, this huge, uh, like, a, like a punch in the stomach. I could almost hear the click before I could hear the sound. Um, so I was very, very hypervigilant um, and really sensitive to, to that. Now, as far as the actual patient care, I was lucky in that I was able to, to have a very narrow focus when I was doing that. And I had an amazing partner who was one of the best medics uh, I've ever worked with. But the, the patient care didn't suffer. But I could see now if, if I hadn't have gotten treatment, it probably would have would have suffered eventually. Do you recall the first moment when you kind of said to yourself that you did need to get a bit of help with it? Yeah, it was um, it was February of last year. My girlfriend Lisa lives about 45 minutes away, and she was trying to get a hold of me in the afternoon, and I had passed out uh, on my couch. So I'm drinking. It was a day off, and she was concerned and called my sons, who live about 10 minutes away from me. My youngest son, Jackson, came over and woke me up, and it was like a almost an impromptu intervention. We talked. A few things that he said that just struck home it was like, you know, Dad, you can't go on like this. You know, I want you to be around, you know, for, for my kids. I want you to be a grandfather. You know, we need you in, in our lives. That hit really hard. And the next morning, I started making phone calls. And I really had to advocate for myself to get the help that I needed. So from that day, it was probably about three weeks before I got my uh, official diagnosis of PTSD. And then I went into treatment March 11th. Uh, last year, I went to Bellwood, which is a, uh, a treatment facility um, in Toronto, and it's one of the best in Canada for PTSD and substance abuse. Did you find once you kind of started that recovery, did it feel good to open up about the experiences you had had? It did, but not right away. Coming up with old school, I mean, I still had a certain stigma attached to it. I mean, you know, I'm not proud of that. Once I got into Bellwood, when I first got there, I thought, I don't need to be here. No, I'm not that bad. And then when you get into your group and you start talking, in my group, there was a police officer, there's myself, another paramedic, and someone from the military. And in those groups is when you feel safe to be vulnerable. And we shared stuff in our in our sessions that you know our, our spouses and our civilians and others still to this day don't know. It, it felt like you had a safety net underneath you and, and you could be vulnerable and you could, you could feel safe. Um, and the counselors there were amazing. I mean, they specialized in trauma. And I was in Bellwood for 99 days. And then I came out uh, June 18th uh, of last year. And I looked at Bellwood as almost like a like, training camp for a sports team. And then when I left Bellwood, it's like the regular season. Now life comes on and you have to take it on life's terms. Bellwood prepared me, I think, very well. There's a lot of programs as far as relapse prevention, a lot of tools to use, you know, for, for grounding, you know, to, to offset your distorted thinking and that type of thing. And then when I got out, my psychologist that uh, I was given, and I was so lucky to have him, Dr. David Hurst, is also a former first responder and in recovery. So it, was, it worked out perfectly for me because he could really understand my perspective from being a first responder and being in recovery. So that, that was a huge blessing. It just, it's just a fluke the way it worked out, but I'm, I'm really thankful for that. And he encouraged 
encouraged me to um, join a peer support uh, group called Badge of Life Canada. Uh, I've joined two, Badge of Life uh, of Canada and Wings of Change. And I think the, the peer support environment uh, that we have has been as important as like, my treatment, my therapy, and everything else. And with, with PTSD, part of the stigma is you think that you're alone. Mm. And nobody can, nobody understands how you're feeling and why you're feeling it because it's it's an invisible injury. Right? If you mm. see somebody with mm. a you know a broken a broken leg and a cast on, someone in society can look and go, oh yeah, that person's injured, and that's why they're doing or not doing whatever it is. But with an invisible injury, people can't see it; they don't understand it. And when you're in the peer support groups, you're with like-minded people. Honestly, I think if you don't have PTSD or haven't experienced it, you can read about it all you want, and but you, you really can't get a grasp on it. You can sympathize, but you really can't empathize because you haven't been there. And when you're in the peer support groups, everybody gets it. And the benefit of that is that you know you, you feel safe because it's a you know you have that common denominator amongst everybody. And then the contacts that you make in those groups, I, I've made some some terrific friends, and you know we check in on each other every couple of days. After meeting, if someone's had a particularly bad week, you know, the next day I'm getting two or three texts saying, hey, I hope you have a better week. You know, a couple of days later, how are you doing? You know, that kind of thing. So it's been a huge part of, of my recovery and my journey. Have you found since going under that journey that with PTSD, is it something that you recover from completely or does it have ongoing strategies? I, I think I'll always have symptoms. But uh, you, you don't actually get cured from it. I think the best that I can hope for is to be able to manage my symptom. And with the tools from my, you know, my psychologist and my treatment at Bellwood and the peer support groups, I, I'm able to do that. And it, it, it doesn't really negatively affect my day-to-day life. I still get triggered at times. And it can be the strangest things. It can be sights. It can be sound. It can be memories that used to almost debilitate me before. But now I can, you know, I can be aware of it, I can sit with it, and I can deal with it, and I can manage it. And I think that's the key for anybody with PTSD, is just being able to manage it. What are some of the tools that you use to manage it? There's different grounding techniques that uh, I I can use that I've been taught with, you know, my therapist and and my occupational therapist. There's uh, there's grounding, there's uh, meditation, there's mindfulness, different uh, ways of looking at and, and, and challenging your thinking. You know, for example, when I first got out of Bellwood and, you know, I live in the city and my station is literally a kilometer away from my house, I would hear the sirens. And before I would get triggered and I would break out into a sweat and my stomach would be doing, you know, flips and full of butterflies. But what they teach me is, you know, okay, I, you know, I'm not at work today. I'm not in that ambulance. I'm not wearing my uniform. And you just challenge your thinking and then try to try to put it into perspective that you know, that's not me right now. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is David Hardgreaves, a Canadian paramedic with a PTSD journey. Despite having PTSD, have you did you really enjoy the work in the paramedic field? I loved it, uh, Jack. <laughs> I really did. I was very proud to wear the uniform. Um, uh, I really, I think the way that we were raised, it really instilled a sense of caring for people and, and helping people. And, you know, I, I felt amazing when I got hired and, and you know, I, I got my uniform and my badge. I was, I was very proud of it. And that's one of the things that really bothered me when I got out of Bellwood because my identity was so so tied up in being a paramedic that there was a there was this huge void of not being able to help people now and and I I missed that and, you know it, um, so then the, the question became okay now like now what and then mm. with the with the uh, the peer support group you know I'm now facilitating for for Badger Light Canada so I'm, I'm helping with the meetings and then um, starting to run workshop a two day workshop to train peer supporters um, that is geared specifically towards paramedics and so that still or that void rather that was that was missing as far as helping people. So, so that that need is being met. From your experience, what can friends and families do that can effectively help someone that has PTSD? Honestly, just don't give up. Yeah, yeah, don't give up on them. Uh, fight for them, support them. But, but you also have to have boundaries. Families need boundaries, and, and you know what, Jack, Jack? Families are the forgotten entity with PTSD. Mm. I mean, it's all about the person that you know has the diagnosis of the of the psychological injury 
but you know that's another thing that we fail on you know besides not preparing people is that we don't prepare family as well for what to expect when you know your your spouse your brother your son goes into the first responder field you know, and we don't we don't teach them how to you know look for these signs or these symptoms and and how to deal with the, you know the the wild mood swings and and uh and, and there's substance abuse and that kind of thing so I, I think we could do a, a much better job of educating families. Um, but as far as families uh, helping, it would be, yeah, I, I would just say, you know, like, don't give up on them because they're not where they want to be. And when they do realize that, when we realize that we do need help, we are really going to need our families. It sounds like that we really need a program in place which formally teaches the families of first responders that about the possibilities of the, some of the mental health issues that may come about within the within their family members in, that are first responders, so that those the family of those first responders can respond to that effectively. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as I know, that that hasn't been done up until just now with with Badge of Light Canada. Um, Sid Gravel and Brad Mackay are the two gentlemen um, that are, have started the uh, uh, the PASS program, which is the, the Peer and Trauma Support System that you know I volunteer with. And so they had a um, their their curriculum was geared towards all first responders, and it's a two day online program or a three day in person, but it was generic to all first responders. And what we've done this year is taken that program and it addresses the seventeen different um, uh, topics that the mental health um, that we have to address when we're, when we're teaching this. And they are gearing the workshop towards specifically uh, specific content towards police officers, firefighters, uh, paramedics, family, um, the Francophone community, the uh, LBGQ uh, community as well. And they're taking two facilitators from each of those branches of the first responders and training them so that we can present the material to, like, for example, myself and my partner, Robin, you know, we can present that material with statistics and a slant towards paramedics so that it resonates more with them. And, you know, two other facilitators are, are handling the, the firefighters and the, and the police and the military, etc. But what's interesting is that they had the foresight to include family in it. So there is a, a program, at least up here, um, that is geared towards families um, and addressing issues that, you know, that I mentioned earlier about the mood swings and what to look for and how to deal with that kind of thing. What would be the take-home from this interview you'd want people to remember the most? I think what I would want people to remember the most is that not all wounds are visible. I think that's part of the stigma that I, that I mentioned earlier, that you know, if people can't see it, they don't understand it. People with PTSD and you know, cope with alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, they don't want to be where they are. They just don't know how to get out of it. it, it it's like you're in a fog. And you don't even realize it until you're, you're, you're deep into it. The understanding that you know, it, it is a real legitimate mental injury, um, and just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not real. And it has such an impact on people that um, I, I really like just to have the, the understanding and, and uh, the stigma addressed. Well, thank you for being on the show today, Dave. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity, Jack. I, I really do. Thanks very much for having this topic. My guest today was David Hardgreaves a Canadian paramedic journeying with PTSD. Tune in to our next episode where we speak with a firefighter about their PTSD journey. And if you like this content, check out the rest of our series on PTSD. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins. And all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.